Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today we're reviewing Justice's Fairness, a restatement, Chapter 4, by John Rawls. Chapter 4 lays out specific systems of the society based on a theory of justice derived from the previous chapter. Rawls starts by proposing five basic regimes, let's call them, to test through his thought experiment. The five regimes as he puts them are laissez-faire capitalism, welfare state capitalism, property-owning democracy, liberal, quote, democratic, unquote, socialism, and state socialism with command economy. Rawls then covers the four basic tests he intends to put each of these basic systems to. Quote, One is the question of right, that is, whether its institutions are right and just. Another is the question of design, whether regimes' institutions can be effectively designed to realize its declared aims and objectives. Third, whether citizens can be relied on to comply with just institutions. Finally, there is the question of competence, whether the tasks assigned to offices and positions would prove too difficult for those likely to hold them. Unquote. So, a few things to call out here. First, this question of justice is applied later in the chapter as a bit of a blunt instrument. I hope we circle back to it in later chapters, because as we'll hear in a moment, certain political movements are more interested in the latter three. Since Rawls glosses over them, and there are concerns, I want to address them a little bit here. So first, as it pertains to design and compliance with institutions, this tends to fall outside the realm of philosophy or political philosophy and more into the realm of science, specifically psychology and economics. People seem to respond to incentives, and behavior seems to be malleable. How malleable and under what circumstances are yet to be determined. I don't think that these can act as a simple test case for rejecting or accepting political systems as a result. Given a system and an ideal end state, people can be prodded the direction you want them to go. Probably. More research is always required. On the question of competence, this is specifically a tut-nut crack. We know that laissez-faire capitalism solves for this by investing no power in government and all power in the economy, the most skilled take the positions they ought to. But I don't think it creates equality of opportunity to ensure that the most skilled are the people in these positions of power. The other systems tend to create perverse incentives. For example, specifically looking at welfare state capitalism, as we see in the U.S. today, the most skilled individuals in any sector of the economy ought to be informing or writing legislation for that sector, but they don't. Incentives align to make it more profitable and therefore a better use of their time to focus efforts on the private sector instead. This gets back to the economics and psychology question. It's possible that this behavior could be modeled and solved for, but more research is required. Regardless, these are wicked problems, and Rawls expresses the importance of the questions, also noting, quote, much conservative thought has focused on the last three questions mentioned above. Specifically, focusing on the inefficiencies our current system of welfare state capitalism has brought with it. He also highlights some of the other pitfalls, such as the fact that some of these regimes lacking enfo effective enforcement mechanisms will likely result in worse outcomes than designed due to social and structural interests. This makes sense to me. Some of the cited regimes are incapable of self-regulating. With laissez-faire capitalism, political power is controlled by wealth and elites, as laid out in some of the previous chapters. Because wealth pulls over time, and capital pulls over time, the wealthy capital-holding class can begin to flex more and more power against lower classes, shaping society to its will. This will, over time, end the principles of reciprocity and stability, and so the system will be unjust. With welfare state capitalism, the same problems will occur, and are occurring, but will take longer. Rawls covered in the prior chapter that some universal basic income doesn't meet his standard of justice because despite it ensuring everyone's needs are met, it still creates, and allows, and perpetuates uh, political unequals, which ignores the reciprocity and stability standard. Of course, as reciprocity is lost, stability also then follows shortly thereafter. 
With state socialism, the state has ultimate control over people's decisions and actions. It's illiberal. As a result, it fails to meet the publicity standard, let alone the standards of reciprocity, which you can't be reciprocal if the state makes economic choices, and stability. You can't be stable if not all voices are equals, as in a command system. State socialism, roundly rejected. Property-owning democracy is a social system where the state ensures property is shared across the population generally. Solving, in theory, the problems of capital pulling and fuel hands, while also ensuring that property can be privately held, and therefore the more well-endowed can surpass the less well-endowed. For Rawls, it's a compromise system. Liberal socialism does something similar, but instead letting the society directly decide how to use its resources and capital. That's enough explanation from me. Let's hear Rawls tell it. So, with that, Rawls begins reviewing the five regimes. He starts by covering the flaws in capitalism. That is, it optimizes for growth, ignoring equality of persons, and equality of opportunity. He rejects welfare state capitalism, stating that it allows large inequalities, which does not meet the standard of reciprocity. He also rejects state socialism, as it violates basic rights and liberties, as well as denying political equality. Each of these can't even meet the basic principles to, consider, to be considered just, in Rawls' view. Rawls then addresses the two remaining regimes. Quote, to illustrate the content of the two principles of justice, we need not decide between a property-owning democracy and a liberal socialist regime. In each case, when their institutions work as described, the principles of justice can be realized. Unquote. Rawls then continues, quote, Justice's fairness does not decide between these regimes, but tries to set out guidelines for how the decision can be reasonably be approached. Unquote. Beyond this point, Rawls airs his ideology a little more. Uh, he prefers property-owning democracy without really explaining why. He does go into some more detail about why these two options are both competent options, but doesn't explain his preference for property-owning democracy. He does take a few swipes at Marx, and by extension socialist thought, including this quote. Quote, Recall the precept cited by Marx, which he thinks will be satisfied in the final stage of communist society, from each according to his abilities, to each according to his needs. Again, as we have seen, native endowments such as intelligence and various natural abilities are not fixed assets with constant capacity. They are, as such, merely potential, and their actual realization depends on social conditions, among which are the social attitude directly concerned with their training, encouragement, and recognition. A usable measure of native endowments seems out of the question, even in theory. So, ignoring that the statement by Marx is a social maxim and not a guiding beacon of Marxist economics, uh, there's nothing that suggests in this work that either proposed system would, preferably, train, encourage, and recognize talent. Hence my commentary about ideology. Rawls includes this to dismiss socialism as an option without presenting evidence that it wouldn't produce those things or providing any evidence that property-owning democracy would. He just airs his preference. Rawls does, however, give Marx a fair shake. For instance, in this passage, quote, Marx would raise another objection, namely that our account of the institutions of property-owning democracy has not considered the importance of democracy in the workplace and in shaping the general course of the economy. This is also a major difficulty. I should now try to meet it except to recall that Mill's idea of worker-managed firms is fully compatible with property-owning democracy. Unquote. Ironically, worker-managed firms is how liberal socialist regimes are defined these days. Perhaps the new two systems are more similar than Rawls cares to admit. Rawls includes a lot more time rebutting arguments against his classifications here, but in the interest of brevity, I've left them out of this episode. More than half the chapter covers side topics to justify the basic tests laid out here, which 
I'm willing to accept the tests given the presentation laid out in the prior three chapters. In this chapter, Rawls explored five basic systems of governance in society and measured them against his theory of justice, given the principles of publicity and reciprocity, as well as stability, laid out in chapter three. Rawls rejects all three forms of capitalism on account of their inability to ensure equality among members in society and lack of controls for ensuring equality of opportunity. He also rejects state socialism for being particularly unjust. In the next chapter, he talks about the test of sp stability specifically, applying it to these political systems. We'll get to that chapter next time. One last item. I started a Discord to maintain copies of the scripts for these episodes starting last episode. Check it out if you're interested. As always, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next week with Chapter 5.